I think when uh, we ask the question, how should one read, it sounds like a very big question, because obviously, for me, I like to read in uh, with noise. I know that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I like having things around me. Um, but I actually get overloaded with a lot of noise if I'm cooking and the fan is on, I get very frustrated. So <laughs> we all have <laughs> our own way of reading and I wanted to speak to you all about that. Um, George, I wanted to start with you. Uh, what's the difference between reading and listening to a piece of writing, poem, or story? That's a great question. What is the difference? Um, well, with reading, of course, you are basically presenting yourself to the intelligence of the writer who you are reading and trying to fathom and, and refabricate in your own mind the ideas and the scenes and the characters and so forth that are being uh, put forth, uh, invented for one's uh, pleasure by an entertainment and edification by the writer. And, and uh, in terms of, of reading aloud, which I think is extremely important, mm -hmm. you have to read you have to read some portion of whatever it is you're reading silently. You should read it aloud. Even on the train, going to work? Well, you know, <laughs> try not to be too obtrusive in terms of other people's privacy and so on. What but does reading out loud do? It puts you, it puts you in touch with the emotions behind that piece. Mm -hmm. That is so important because we often think of literature or we're taught to think of literature as simply being a series of stories or or whatever, or poetry that rhymes and it makes pretty pictures and so on. But every piece of writing, not only is it in invested with communicating ideas and philosophy, it is also uh, conveying the emotion of the author in putting forward these plots, putting forward these characters, creating these scenes. Emotion has to drive everything. I think the, the beauty of poetry is that emotion and intellect are absolutely absolutely conjoined. But you can only really feel that if you, in fact, read those uh, those words aloud. Does anybody else do that, read out loud? I, I read my own work out loud. Mm. I don't read other people's work out loud. Mm. Um, and I read my own work out loud because then I know whether the rhythm is right, whether, the, I mean, immediately, if it's awkward, I'll stumble over it and, and know that it needs to be edited. But it's interesting. So I don't, I don't read other people, not to myself, I don't. Mm. That would be an interesting exercise, except it would slow me down. Mm. I mean, for me, reading is the um, entering the page. Getting entering lost. the page. Yeah. Not getting lost, yeah. actually, waking up. Oh. Waking up, being aroused and invigorated by what I'm reading. I don't want to lose myself, I want to meet myself. Anyone else read out loud or? What I've been doing um, lately is maybe a little bit sacrilegious, but I use actually a program that reads books to me, which is a trick I actually learned from a friend of the show, JL Richardson, so that I can do the dishes. <laughs> 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 I have laundry, my glamorous life. Um, but it's really interesting because I think you might be a bit horrified, George, but because the robot isn't very good at reading, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and you can choose different voices, but they're all kind of terrible. But I think it's really fascinating because when you listen to a lot of books that way, it creates kind of a democratic effect where it's equally bad oh. at reading all of them to you. So what it winds up, I think, is allowing some essential nature of the work to come to the fore. But yeah, it's been sort of, I mean, these technologies are such a part of our life now, mm. so it's been very interesting to interact with literature through them. They're not a part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, no. <laughs> Vincent, what about you? Similar to Liz, mm -hmm. I read my own work aloud as I'm editing, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's tremendously important as mm -hmm. part of my editing process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, my one of my favorite spots to read is sitting on the porch in front of my house. Mm -hmm. And it's great because I love the spot mm -hmm. and it's also great because people might come by and say hello. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm both in that space and, mm -hmm. and able to enter another space through reading, but I, do feel that if I were to sit there and read out loud, <laughs> they'd be like, uh, "Something's happening with Vincent." <laughs> My neighbors might be concerned. Um, George could probably pull it off. <laughs> yeah, um, if I could just say something very quickly, and it and it goes like this, and I'm coming back to this to this notion of uh, reading aloud as an not only as an act of homage to uh, another writer and especially a poet, 
but also as a way to hear the textures of the words, the syllables, the accent, the rhythm, mm -hmm. as Liz has, has mentioned, as a way of understanding the entire worldview, the heart of the matter, mm -hmm. the, the pulse of the matter. Because when you read, I gotta, I gotta quote Ian Fleming, somebody has to. <laughs> he said that all speech starts with the stomach muscles. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. your, your very act of speaking comes from the gut automatically, and then you add to that pulse, breath, exhalation, inhalation, uh, the movement of your tongue, your teeth, uh, your uh, through your mouth to actually express those words. So then when you get to say something like, or you get to quote someone like William Blake and his sunflower, and he mm -hmm. says, ah, sunflower, weary of time, and you feel it, mm -hmm. you feel the shivers go I'm down your spine, now, yeah. Yeah. right? Because, or, or Yates, that is no country for old men. Right, and, and you suddenly think of the Hollywood movie. Oh yeah, that's right. It's not a very, it's not a good country for old men. <laughs> well, it's but... so interesting you mentioned movies because I've watched, I've had some favorite books, um, and then I've watched the TV versions or the movie versions, and sometimes it's been a good experience, but sometimes I'm like, that's not how I saw it. That's not how I felt it. Is that something that you're? Is that the point that you're? Have, has anyone else experienced that? Well, just to jump in on that very quickly, yeah. the, the thing that you really, and I wanted to say this earlier, uh, I, I like to remind students that, that uh, there's a reason why actors and directors actually come at scripts, whether it's for a play or for a film, um, by having that, that reading aloud of the script. Mm -hmm. Because that is what puts you in touch with the character, and with, the, with the whole story and the development of the character is actually hearing those words being presented. But you're a performer. You are a performer. Everybody's a performer. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not like you, George. <laughs> each of us may have a bit of ham inside us, but no, you are a performer. And, and, and someone who isn't a performer has a, has a different relationship with the page. And it's an intimate, silent uh, uh, relationship. Liz, silent reading is definitely okay. I, <laughs> I recommend it for everybody. But I agree with you about reciting poetry and, and, and how wonderful it is when you actually memorize a poem and can recite it, okay. e however badly. <laughs> however badly. One other just little writer <laughs> attached to, uh, attach to what you just said. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Barack Obama was a breath of fresh air yes. in 2008 when he was seeking the election uh, for the first time is the is because of his oratory. Yes, of course. Those speeches, they were so great compared to George W. Bush yes. and his inability to utter anything uh, that that could be un, that was comprehensible. Uh, uh, that fact that he was able to articulate positions so beautifully, powerfully, emo emotively, and move people in the millions to desire something better. But that's also, as we've seen in history, though, we, there's been great orators who've moved history in the other direction. Absolutely, but that's not the that's <laughs> not the fault of the or that's not the fault of oratory itself mm -hmm. or the fault of rhetoric. And we should remember that that, for instance, at the time of Shakespeare, if you're going to become a poet, you studied rhetoric. Yes, rhetoric is about tricks of speech, ornaments of speech, metaphor, tropes of one sort or another. But there's, so, a, there's also silent eloquence. Yeah. And there's silent eloquence on a quiet page. Sure, I, I agree. Yeah, you can sit back and relax with the book and read <laughs> well, it silently. I mean, but we're I'm talking saying... about we're talking about reading now. Yeah, we and, are. and and you've taken over with reading aloud. Well, and I'm just no. putting up a word in defense of reading quietly to oneself. I'm all in favor where you're of, not bothering anybody. I'm all in favor or of silent a sleeping reading. baby in the room, but I wanted to kind of. <laughs> well, I think what I like about what both Liz and George are saying, American yeah. presidents aside, is that what you're talking about is a kind of reading that gives so much credit to the author for being deliberate about the choices they made. That every single sound, every syllable, mm -hmm. every piece of punctuation mm -hmm. matters, and I think that's so true. I think that sometimes when there may be a rush to publish, or when you think about the glut of books that's published daily, there's this sense that there isn't enough time, I think, to put that work into it. But I love that idea of getting readers to believe that 
you know, that authors think about every single thing on the page. Because when I used to teach close reading, sometimes I would have students who would say things like, they didn't really think about where this comma went. And I say, no, they did. So I'll have to point them to both <laughs> of you. As you think about every single piece of the work, every single piece of the work matters. And you can read it silently, or you can read it aloud, and you can feel kind of um, the torque of how much every single piece on the page matters. Well, I wanted to um, ask Vincent this question, because on the ravine, I think all of us probably know someone who has gone through something similar. Um, when you're writing, do you ever worry about how your what you're writing will impact a reader, um, if it will cause like maybe moral distress uh, from someone who's reading your writing? Well, it's always possible that that may happen, mm -hmm. and moral distress can be very enhancing and distressing, and productive, and limiting. Mm -hmm. The experience of being challenged as a reader is, I think, one of the deep values of reading. And so that's also one of the reasons we write. So I don't think we can shy away from being challenging mm -hmm. as writers. I think it's very important that we're respectful. And part of being respectful for me as a writer means writing from a sense of what I feel is true to the characters who inhabit these pages, mm -hmm. and true to them as human beings, as fictional human beings, but as human beings, rather um, than trying to impose some sort of authorial agenda mm -hmm. upon them. And when I reflect on the, um, the, the question you asked about um, reading and, and also film, mm -hmm. and, and this notion that sometimes film feels like it's less, you know, cinema feels like it's less, um, I, I think that when we see something on the screen, we simultaneously are given less and more. Mm, what do you mean by that? So the, the more part is obvious mm -hmm. because we're given sounds and images and sets. It's all kind of right there. It's like a buffet. Mm -hmm. But we're given less because all of, all of that takes so much of our sensory attention um, that we often have less room to, to actually enter inhabit and imagine. Mm -hmm. And so so books give us also less but more. And they give us less because it's just 26 letters. And there are some punctuation marks. And I, I do think actually a great deal about my commas, mm. much to the consternation of my editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop it already. Just put the comma just wherever put you it like. Anywhere. Put it anywhere. Like, what about an exclamation care. point? I I, yeah, I shudder to think what my editor thinks right now while we're talking about this, but yeah, a lot of thought and uh, um, a lot of care uh, mm -hmm. on, on my part, frustration on the part of my editors, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. But um, but we just have the 26 letters. We we just have a few marks on paper, and so we're giving less. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more room to imagine and inhabit. And I think if we're if we're actually writing about things which matter, then there is the potential that they will be difficult to read, and and that's also part of the importance. And so if, if that's what we're doing, then we have to leave space mm -hmm. for people to inhabit it uh, as their mind will allow them to mm -hmm. inhabit it. I mean, I think this is something I think about a great deal, uh, perhaps in part because um, this novel was the first novel that I wrote that a number of people read. And I was surprised then to have to sort of live in the consequences of my actions. Some people have very strong reactions to how the story is quite sad. And I don't think it's bleak, but some people read it that way. And it did make me think twice about not only what I put readers through, but also what I put my characters through. I tend to write about characters who are not white, who are dealing with social barriers. And sometimes I struggle with the fact that I'm writing stories where I'm putting them through more suffering, you know? Mm -hmm. And is that sort of, I don't want to not write about the real world, and I don't want to not write about those kinds of characters, because I think that's what I feel my role as an author is to do. Mm -hmm. But it does feel sort of like, how do we find that balance between not kind of relying on that narratives that are sort of run by trauma, where the reason why there's drama, the reason why there's excitement is because we're just traumatizing characters, mm -hmm. but how do we also write about the real world in a way that gets at some of those things we were talking about before, you know, about the politics of it, of the barriers 
barriers of what makes the world what it is. Kind of expands your mind to other people's realities. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I sort of love what you say, Vincent, that maybe sometimes it's about trusting the reader, trusting the reader to step back if they need to, you know, to engage if they need to. Because in the end, I think literature, I always think it's sort of like a holodeck, like from Star Trek. It's a simulation for the problems of our world. It's a place to um, work through certain things in, in a place that's more safe, and that maybe that is what our role is as artists, to create that. And and, yeah, and, and then the ideal reader would be someone who who brings sympathy to these characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And who, who has a mind open enough to change. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's what's exciting about literature. You can yes. often, people often change their minds unintentionally <laughs> and, when and, reading and, literature. And the, and, the, and the wonderful shocks of narrative. Mm -hmm. Who would want to lose those? Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, you know, you've said that um, when you were a broadcaster, you described yourself as a writer with a split personality. All right. Uh, what did you mean by that? I thought that was so interesting. Well, that was when I was in radio mm -hmm. years ago, and and there were radio scripts that I needed to write, and and they followed a kind of formula, um, a journalistic formula of place and uh, you know voice, and then these were. Uh, as I say, radio documentaries. And on the side, I was doing my own writing, such as it was, you know, in the notebooks I kept, uh, which was my way of, you know, staying sane. But the difference between those two kinds of writing did make me feel like a split personality, that I had to write a certain way for radio, and then I could write my own way in my own life. And then I realized over time, actually, that that wasn't true. That, that the elements um, that make a good radio story are the elements that make any good story. Uh, Which elements would you say those are? The, the, well, what is the story about? You know, the, produ the old horrible producer's question, what is the story about, you know, in, in radio, mm -hmm. is, is, is perfectly um, acceptable to ask. But I didn't ask it, my, it of myself in my own writing. Um, Where's the momentum? How are you building? What's the next, you know, how does one thing build on the next? Mm -hmm. the, these, these were essential questions in radio, and I didn't trouble to ask myself or make myself address them in my own writing. And, and, and also, the different, you know, in, in radio and in any good writing, there's economy, directness, someone is actually talking to you about what matters to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, one of the themes that I... Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say, when you applied the rules of radio to your own writing, did that make the process of your own writing more or less enjoyable? Oh, it's all hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I was very willing to get away with murder right. in my own writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting because um, I, it's, it's like... Uh, anyway, I, it's a different tangent. Um, one of the themes that I guess I'm getting from um, while we're having this discussion when it comes to reading, we some people read out of boredom. Some people um, might read because they want to learn more about something. Um, but is the purpose of reading a story, uh, a poem, it, could it be to find meaning, George? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, it can be about finding meaning, but it can also be about um, thinking differently, learning to think differently yourself. Mm -hmm. Because every writer is putting forward his, her, their philosophy of life and whatever it is that they are writing, everything that they write. And so uh, the reader can be challenged, uh, can be inspired, can be angered, can be turned off, can be turned on, can be excited. All of the above is possible so long as that reader, of course, is, is engaging with the particular ideas and philosophies that the writer is putting forward. But I'm going to, again, claim the prerogative of a poet. <laughs> and recite <laughs> a, little, a little thing here, which is about a visit to the Annapolis Royal Historic Gardens. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, I'm just gonna read the last portion of it. Uh, I visited the gardens on a fall day, uh, I think it was 2000. Nearby accumulates a pungent cascade of leaves, then the thick, gigantic stalks of marsh grass, with sunlight baying in, Nostalgic, regretful, imploring, like the speaker in a John Thompson gazelle. With the last maniacal mosquitoes whining, come de plut, and strafing still fragrant, still bloody roses, near where the train tracks are kaput, 
all torn up now, these roses glistening and perfuming dogmatically, while the eye hooks on notorious flagrant orange-red trees and bowers of vines, other overhanging things darkening just as the sun darkens while first launching light against the dikes, the marsh in dying brilliance, equivalent to what Carmen paints in low tide at Grand Pre, dismissive of our idiot anxieties and ironies, stately lances, the august, sepulchral, elegiac light. Excellent. Well done. That's incredible. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is incredible. Oh and God. this is your poem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> Just to illustrate, you know, the, just the a little power. something, something. <laughs> well, just one other quick thing, very quick. I mean, one of the, what we've also been talking about in this sex in this session of the, uh, of the program is voice. Yes. V o i c e voice, mm. and the different ways in which a reader picks up the voice of the author, and and the disseminated voice of the author through characters and and so on. But it all comes back, ultimately, for me, to the vocalization and the verbalization. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned voice, uh, but Vincent, are words or is context more powerful? That's that's like choosing between uh, sweet and salty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can hang out. Popcorn with M&Ms? Oh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, what what we're trying to do uh, as writers is we're, we're trying to sometimes... Um, you know, I think the, the, the best moment for me as a reader is when I read something that both surprises me and then in the same instant seems utterly self-evident. Yeah. You know, I think, yes, I mean, that's what, that's what that flower looks like. That's how someone would say that. And, and, and I'm, I'm stunned by, by how right it is. And I, I think we... Um, we, we get there mm -hmm. by placing words in context in, in an observant and a curious way. Taya, I see you nodding. I was just thinking about the phrase that, you know, great writing is shocking but inevitable, which I always hate because I'm like, that's impossible. I'll never be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's exactly it, isn't it? And I think when it comes together, even if it's something you've done yourself, there's still something mysterious about how it happened, which I think is part of the wonder that you feel like you're tapping into something timeless or universal. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the reader, of course, is, is uh, or the ideal reader, is, is someone who enters the book uh, willing to inhabit other mm -hmm. lives and yeah. then yeah. meets themselves. Yeah. You know, meets unexpectedly something that actually really resonates with their own life. Mm -hmm. And then their, whole, their, their own life suddenly has so much more meaning. Yeah, and I think something that's challenging about our current climate of reading is that readers are so often um, encouraged to rank books, <laughs> to yes. give it a score on right. a scale of one to five. And I think that what that often means that happens is that readers think of a work as almost like a transactional good. Mm -hmm. Like, is it kind of like a salad that, you know, mm. was a, it was a four-star salad? Did it really do what I wanted it to do? Mm -hmm. And so I think what's lost in that is that idea that you should actually need to meet a book where it is. Like, sometimes if a book is unsettling, as you were talking about, or a book is boring, maybe it wanted to be that way. And can we meet those books where we are? Can we inhabit, can we accept what they're offering? We don't always have to like it. Mm -hmm. I think liking is kind of overrated, but can we sort of appreciate what it's offering to us? Is there a right way to read? Well, I think it depends on the book, because there's plenty of books that are very happy, I think, to provide an escape, you know, to provide something that's familiar. And I personally love reading books like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to be able to distinguish between the kinds of books that maybe are there because they're trying to uh, push the bounds a little bit more because their their job is to maybe require us to think about, you know, kind of issues that are, that are close to the bone, that are real, that are maybe even in some dimension spiritual. So I think as readers, we have to be able to discern what kind of book we're reading. As writers, you're sharing uh, parts of yourselves that we wouldn't know unless you shared it with us. Um, isn't there an expectation that you are putting yourself out there for people to see? Well, I think fiction has many layers. And but it's still there, right? <laughs> you need to know or well, experience yes, something the, to be able to describe it. I think the fiction that certainly I myself, mm -hmm. uh, or I tell myself as a writer, is this fiction that I'm just interacting with the book. Mm -hmm. 
And I maintain that fiction right until the very end, until the book is published. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It may not be true. <laughs> but it works but for I you. Yeah. yeah. We're not going to disturb the process because no, what you're doing is no. working so far. <laughs> I, I mean, I really relate to that. That's so funny because I think you sort of think of it as almost like an object, almost like when people film something disturbing as a way of getting distance. And I think that's sometimes what I'm doing when I'm creating. So I think of it as an object that exists on its own. Mm -hmm. And it's totally true that when a reader reaches out to you and says, oh, that moved me or that spoke to me, you're like, oh, you saw through me. <laughs> it's this moment of surprise. But it is, I think, yes, yeah, so wonderful. I'm always so touched when someone would bother to take the time to write me a note, to not only engage with the work, but to also write to me and, and tell me how it made them feel. I think those people must be great, noble people. Um, on the other hand, there are many platforms, I think, in which readers can discuss works with each other mm -hmm. and sort of let loose if they really didn't like something. Mm -hmm. And I think of those platforms as being solely for readers. I think authors should never go to those places. <laughs> They form an important function, I think, in, in civic society. So you never but... want to be like a fly on the wall in a book, a book club? Oh, I have attended <laughs> a book club meetings, which I also kind of, always kind of love. Um, it's always so interesting to see, to see people arguing about mm -hmm. what your own characters meant, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think is, is really fun. But no, I think readers need that space. They need the space to say, as much as I, I sort of want everyone to sort of approach my work in good faith, being a reader is a really important function, and, and you deserve the space to not like something, to hate something, to argue about it with your friends. I think those spaces where readers can do that are important, and to some degree sacred, and I think authors should stay out of them. <laughs> it's so, it's so, I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, I can't believe this is my job. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, we're, that concludes our conversation on this topic. Uh, we're going to be discussing something that I think a lot of people shy away from admitting or even talking about, which is failure hmm. and hmm. other obstacles. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time, and uh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.